going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Old Turf Podcast. I'm one of your hosts. They call me Daddy on the side, but I'm Andy T. Coming at <laughs> I'm straight from Indianapolis. You guys serious? Where, I wonder who they are. You, you call him Daddy Reese? Yeah, not this. Re- not I don't me. call him Daddy Reese. It must, it must be Kevin. Okay. I, I've never. Come on now. Come on now. Don't let them fool you. I was, I was late to the show today. And as I came in, they're like, where's daddy? Where's daddy? And then they got real quiet when I logged in. It was weird. See, we all know he's lying. He was actually, he was the first one on the pod. Couldn't wait to get today started. I'm excited. He's fired up. He's fired up. To preface, I'm going to preface this quickly. Ladies and gentlemen, he watched the entire Rutgers game. He has a lot of thoughts. He couldn't wait to get on here and share some of those thoughts. So hurry up and introduce your guys. You know, so I can so I can start rocking. I'm Travis. I'm handsome. That's all I got to say. Reese Mona checking in. Kevin Herter, you know what it is. Let's let's get this started. All right. So who watched the the Rutgers? <laughs> who watched that? I tuned in. You saw watch. all your texts, dude. It was, <laughs> that wasn't just like a bad game. That was so. This is what we got today, guys. Just so you don't think we're going to be negative, Nancy's. You know, like we are every other week. Uh, Travis said it best. All we do is sit here and, you know, oh, we can't shoot. We stink, blah, blah, blah. We're going to switch it up today. We're going to start with that. And then we're going to midway through, we're going to start <laughs> a- asking uh, certain questions that you guys asked over Twitter, uh, which we appreciate. You guys can keep doing that. We're going to actually open up a Twitter handle here soon so that you guys can submit questions. But anyway, um, I'm just not understanding <laughs> As a Division One basketball team, so we talk about how many offensive rebounds we get and things like that. It's because we miss every shot. <laughs> when the league was three, it was insurmountable. I knew, right? And then when it was a one point game, midway through the second half, we've got we've got Dante coming off of a a crackback. <laughs> Guys, what are we doing? Like, do we not even run plays? Here's my question: Do we run plays, and if so, are any of them good? Well, well, I can, I can, I can start the question with: If Jameer is not scoring, what plays are you running, and for who? If, if the guy's going to shoot three for seventeen, which I'll start, that happens. Three for seventeen is is no bueno. But like, you're going to have an off game from a guy at home. It's not ideal. But Jameer's been bailing us out all year. If if he's not scoring, especially, what do you go to? Especially with the run he's have he's been having, like I can accept the three from seventeen night for him. Like he's been he's been money for a month and a half. So I you, you can't fault him. He's he was due for an off night. Well, the problem was he was on all those nights and we were still losing. So now when he's not hitting, <laughs> what do we expect to happen? I mean, we had a stretch there where we were we were down nine with like six minutes left. That kid for Rutgers gets a technical. And then we go on a little 6-0 spurt. And, you know, everybody's fired up. They're excited, amped up, and, and happy. And all I'm thinking is we're down three, fellas. We got no chance. We can't <laughs> score the rock unless we get two more technicals against the other team. Because we have nothing. And I'm sorry, but Jameer, like... He not only didn't score, but when he doesn't score, dude, his turnovers are crazy. Like the worst turnovers I've ever seen. It goes to him just trying to force. Like we've seen a lot of times him trying to attack the paint, get downhill, and make something out of nothing. And that's where a lot of his his turnovers come from, just trying to make plays. In his defense, though, if you guys were Big Ten coaches and you were game planning to play Maryland, what would you tell your guys? All five of you, all ten eyes, Jameer Young. Nothing else matters. If you give up a three, if you give up a shot to another person, we'll live. We will. We will live. Do not let him shoot the ball. I would be. You remember a couple years ago? I think it was maybe my freshman year. Nate Mason on Minnesota. I think we yeah. blitzed every single ball screen that he was in. We were, we were like blitz the shit out of daring him. somebody else to beat us or make shots in order to change our coverage. If I was playing Maryland right now. Jameer Young, every single time he saw a ball screen, he's seen two guys. And you're making him swing it. it. Until, he, until he passes the ball, do, two people on him. Do not leave. Until he – make him pass the ball. Do not let him, do not let him shoot. Here, here's my question to you guys. What would the scouting report be against us? What do you think Purdue scouted against us? I have no idea. But, you know, or a Minnesota and IU. 
how how do you scout that? What do you do? Do you think it's legitimately, hey, let's just do an absolute hard hedge and make them get rid of it and then let everybody else shoot? Or if you guys were a coach, what would you guys do? I mean, part of basic scouts is you say he's a non-shooter, he's a non-shooter. And if you go through Maryland, it's he's a non-shooter, he's a non-shooter, he's a non-shooter. Let's stop Jameer. So if you look at the way I we we did a lot of scouting reports over the course of four years. I don't think I ever heard he's a non shooter. He's a non shooter. Reese He's a non shooter. He he's definitely a non shooter. Well, Walter Reese just Maryland scouted my seventh by. grade C team. Reese just literally <laughs> did the scouting report for the seventh grade C team that I coached earlier this year. Well, bro, that's how Bunch of Russian basketball is. You, if you get the ball out of the one or two guys who can dribble, all of a sudden the team can't score. And that's essentially when you look at Maryland, the way they're guarding a lot of guys like Deshaun and um, Geronimo, it's they can help off. So they're going to make sure Jameer's not scoring. You close out short, and you're right back in guarding position. So it just makes it tough. The, the only thing that I'll add to this – to this Rutgers thing before we get off of this and we start finding some positivity and or solutions is, and I mean this, nobody, and I mean nobody watches more hoops than I do. I got hoops on both TVs right now, and then I've got a third one on the Stream East for NBA downright. That was the worst 40 minutes of basketball. I, I'm being dead honest. I have ever watched, and I watch, you, I watch Southern Indiana games. All right. <laughs> Worst All right. I've ever seen. What the hell are you doing watching Sun- Southern Indiana games, man? Here, here's your diamond in the rod. Also, you said streamies. You can't afford League Pass? No. <laughs> no. S- something that we've referred to also on the show is this isn't, unfortunately, anything new. You, you go to Maryland right now, we've we have the best defense in the conference mixed with the second worst offense in the conference. I think it was, it was telling after the game, Coach Willard talking about it's concerning their – uh, their focus level when they play at home. Like it seems like there's a better focus. We're on the road. A lot of that is because Jameer has saved us at the end of games. But the things that we've talked about for this team, the way we're going to win games, you need to turn people over. You need to speed up the game. We're going to slow down offensively just because we're going to we're going to try to run sets, get Jameer to his left hand. But like we we are doing the things. We're putting ourselves in positions to win offensively. We just we just can't get there offensively. We're we're fine defensively. We're picking up full court. I think in, in a lot of ways our effort and our energy has been fine over the course of the season. It's just the offensive side of the court we still have yet to consistently figure out. We keep getting questions on what's wrong with the offense, and I think just quite simply you, you cannot rely on two or three guys the way we rely on two or three guys. A couple of stat lines from the Rutgers game. I, I don't mean to pile on anybody. like We understand what's going on, but Jahari Long over for two points. Caleb Swan Rogers, one for one, two points. Jamie Kaiser, 0 for 5, two points. Jordan Geronimo, one for four, two points. Deshaun Harris Smith, one for three, two points. So outside of Juju, Dante, and Jameer, we combined for two, four, six, eight, ten points. You you can't win high major conference basketball games with everybody outside of three guys scoring 10 points. It's 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 physically impossible. And it's sad because, like you said, Kev, our defense is good enough that we can beat just about anybody in the country. But hang on. Read Rutgers' stat line. This is my concern. Read Rutgers' stat line of that same game. The, I'm, they're, it's, it's nasty. I don't even <laughs> want to say it out loud. Those guys suck. That, it makes it even worse. I didn't want to say it out loud because those, those guys suck. Well, that I think it's, that's the issue is – we have this defense. I don't understand how we can't create more offense from our defense. I mean, 90% of the time we're, we're playing against a non-set defense and we're not scoring in transition, which I understand that means running your lanes and hitting a couple open shots, but how do you switch that up? You know? Okay. That's, that's a good question because one of the best questions that I think we got, um, and it came from, let me find his handle. Um, while you're gone. It was run, runner Terp fan. If you guys were coaching, how would you get this thing turned around this season in the future? And I, one of the things we said early on was we would press, right? Like three-quarter court, two-two-one, something, something. 
Yeah. We're not scoring enough off turnover. Right. So, so I think that is a perfect segue into this one, this first question, by the way, great question, fella. Um, what would you guys do to help get some offense going, knowing that we don't have a ton of shooters? Y'all might hate this answer and a lot of people might, but I would, if we don't have transition, if you don't have a layup or wide open three, I would run a play, an actual play every single time down the court <laughs> because <laughs> you, because you don't want the wrong guys taking shots. And the way you do that is you call plays for certain players and you actually know it. Just the way our offense is, you're not moving the ball. It's just Jameer ball screen. So you actually have plays that might have Dante coming off a curl screen. You might have D- DHS getting downhill. You might have Jameer coming off something to get him involved. I I would run plays because offense is that bad. I would I would slightly disagree on that end, especially at the point in the season that we're at now. We're we're not we're not in December now. We're at a point yeah. where there's supposed to be progress in the season. Teams are supposed to get better playing with each other. If you're calling a play every time down the court, like the game is going to go super slow. You're going to have players staring at the sideline all game. It's going to be too choppy. There's no rhythm and flow to a game. Like you need to create rhythm and flow for your players. Uh, the simple answer is it's tough when you have personnel. Like first you have to be capable. Are right, the guys that we start the game and you guys got it, like who who on the court is a creator for this offense? You know, especially with the struggles that DHS has had over the course of the season, been forced to play Jahari Long more minutes than I think Willard probably anticipated going into the season. And I think for the most part, Jahari's played pretty well. But outside of like guys creating offense, you've Dante's never been a creator. Jordan's not a creator. Juju, uh, you, know, you can play inside out. You know, certain games that's going to work. But for the most part, you've Jameer on the court trying to create everything for for everybody. And that's where I think just running plays like you're running a play to get a guy a shot. Who on this team outside of Jameer are we going to run a play to get a shot for? My thing is, I agree with you, Kev. My whole thing is, I, I like to add on. I'm a, I'm more of a, like, if you can shoot 28%, you better shoot 100 threes because 28 threes actually matter. So I'm huge on like, hey, let's shoot more threes. Let's have quicker possessions. Let's go try to score the rock because <laughs> who, our defense. Who do you want? If we shoot 100 I, threes, I, we're I not making 28. Who do you want to shoot them? That, but- Actually, I don't. I don't. This actually went under the radar. Now that I'm looking at the box score, I didn't realize this. Guess how many guys made a three against Rutgers? Two. One. Guess how many guys made a three point field goal against Rutgers? One person. Two. Ooh. Well, we, one. How many? We should... Jameer. Jameer Young went two for four. The rest of the team o for was 0 for sixteen. Sixteen. I guess maybe you shouldn't. Sh- shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I think. <laughs> You guys remember this. Turgeon did this in our second year, and this starts in the offseason. A lot of times with these coaches and these programs, you have to teach your guys how to play basketball. How can you create yeah. a shot without, like Reese said, me calling a play every single time down the court? Our second year with, with Turgeon, we got to a point where we, we called our motion, and there was no rules other than you had to screen for each other. And so in the offseason, yeah. we, we played three-on-three. Three. We, we learned how to set pin-down screens, back screens, and it literally just that became – and, and you can't scout it. It became an offense where there were really no rules other than you had to move bodies and you had to screen for each other, and that was going to create offense. And so there's times down the court he's calling motion, and we kind of and you, you look around and you look at each other, and guys would just start screening and moving. We just played the Pacers. You go to the NBA. Rick Carlisle, when we played the Pacers, the name of a play that they run is literally called random. He yells from the sideline, yells random. And all their guys begin it. You know, they call these uh, – these slip screens, guys are sprinting at the ball, slipping out, trying to look for threes. Bigs coming in for screens, rolling to the rim. And it was literally just random offense, but it's it's teaching you guys how to play the game. So you're not have kind of guys standing in corners and, and one big inside and you're passing and you're standing at each other. A lot of this offense of us getting better, and that's why I talk about we're at the point in February, guys need to be better learning how to play the game and playing with each other. And unfortunately, we're at a point in the season, if you don't have a lot of creators, guys are going to be able to screen and move for each other. Yeah, I agree. And it's like you said, is is it too late to actually try to put something in like that? But to your point, I also meant like every play, if you call it flow, it's fine. But actually yelling at the guys to run flow every time, meaning like you're saying, or motion, just because I don't think these guys can play that well with each other. But if you have a continuity set to run it, tell the guys to run it. So they're on the same page because it doesn't look like offense on the same page. Mm-hmm. 
the only thing about running an offense like that, was, which is difficult at times, is guys need to know what you're trying to accomplish with, with an offense like that. Like, I think, like, again, if you're going to run that, the goal should be to get Jameer, Dante, or Juju a shot, right? Like, the goal is not to run that offense and to, like, get somebody else coming off a double and shooting a three. And I think that's something that is not easy to pick up. Like, I don't I don't see that from us. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, like, when we ran that sophomore year, most of the time I felt like, the ball was going to end up even either be it in Ant's hands or Kev's hands, and one of those guys was going to shoot the ball, or at least that was the goal of it. That is something that I don't know if we are capable of doing. Hey, hey, Jordan, <laughs> just go screen for Jameer and then roll to the rim. Hey, Dante, right after Jordan screens, go screen for Jameer and then roll to the rim. <laughs> like You're telling these guys, hey, you're a catch-and-shoot guy or roll to the rim. Uh, hey, you, you stay space, Jameer. Take thirty shots for me, please. Can we? Can we do that? That's how I. That's the NBA guy. That's the NBA guy. That's the NBA guy talking. <laughs> that that is that is that is a professional basketball player talking. That, but then then okay, so here play devil's advocate because I agree with all that stuff <laughs> until they blitz the ball screen like they do every other time <laughs> out of nowhere. Dante pops ninety percent of the time because he won't roll because he's a three point gunner. And then, you know, Juju gets doubled on the on the baseline. He can't do anything. So then what? Because well, I think that's what they're trying to do. I think Willard is saying this. Like, hey, guys, we have a guy that's good. Let's use him more often. And it's not working. So how would you – I think that's the question, though. Like, what do you do? Like, if you're Willard, I'd be sitting there looking in the mirror saying, fuck. <laughs> <We're sure. laughs> this like, is he's not a miles pal jameer is just, jameer is a off the dribble type of guy that can create things like that but he's still what six foot he's not that quick he's not that athletic he's not a miles pal where you know he can shoot over people so what do you do when your best player is 150 percent reliant on ball screens and praying they don't blitz just to reiterate, I actually agree with Kev's point. I think our best bet is to muck the game up and just do some random dumb shit and let guys run around a little bit and play free. I think the answer there, though, is, like, move him off the ball. Like, don't have him initiating offense where all 10 eyes are on him and you know a ball screen is coming to him and you can blitz it and everybody can load up and help. Like, find some ways to, like, put him in a corner and then – have him, have him come off a quadruple screen. Like, literally have three guys set a screen and the, the five-man hand him the ball and just figure – you know what I'm saying? Just, like, muck the game up. Make, like, what offense move are you him talking off the ball. about right there? Carson Edwards. Yeah. yeah. Car- Purdue. I, yeah. They what Purdue now. would call a play every time. Hundred percent, and they they that that they they are also they are also absolutely fucking clinical. Yeah, they're clinical. Well, and they have I I understand that they have you know I think like eight hundred different designs, and that's all they do. Like I've heard about some of their practices in summer. They get there at five a.m. They go till eight, and they literally walk through plays over and over. I mean, they have eight hundred different designs out of sets, which like is overkill. Yeah. Until you get into a situation like this where you're like, well, what the hell do we do when we have guys that really don't understand how to play basketball that well together? And and what do we do? You walk the ball up, like Reese said, and you create offense. If you don't have that, then I think you go the opposite route. You, you, just, also, you go quick. It's a sign of a good coach, like being able to create offense for guys that can't create it themselves. Like Purdue, even their makeup this year, you know, they have a bunch of guys out there. If you told them that, if you gave him the ball and said go one on one, a lot of those guys can't go get their own shot, and they just—that's a sign of good coach. Like they—they they run plays, but the difference between Purdue and unfortunately where we're at right now is you got to have a guy who can make an outside shot, who can make a three. Like if if you can't shoot threes or make threes, whether you're in the NBA or, or in college, it is going to be tough to score. Like we we can throw it's replaceable. We can throw a million of these solutions out there, and Willard is searching. <laughs> like you, you know, he's you can feel he's a little bit tired of the same question marks you know he's a little bit tired of not being able to score and he's trying to find answers at some point you need guys to make shots you know what's funny about that is because he said before like i don't know i don't i don't know what the issue is because i'm sure in practice they probably shoot the piss out of ball in practice 
like 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 stand still, shoot around, walk and do plays. They probably shoot the ball well in practice. They just for some reason can't knock down shots in games. And that leads me to another great question. At betting with snacks, I don't know what that means, but Uncle Snacks, great question. How true is it that you can't coach shot making? The defense has been great this season, but is the offensive ineptitude more coaching or just missed opportunities? I think the shot making is a good question. I, I think that's almost a 100% Kevin question. I mean, like you see it with NBA guys, you can't shoot shots that Kevin Durant can't. Now, that's obviously height has a huge factor and all that stuff. But different people are hoopers. Different people are, are basketball players. So, like, when you see that and you see somebody go to the NBA, you know, it, how, how do you think that scales up to being able to coach tough shot making? I think, first of all, like, you need to instill confidence. And I think each coach has a different way of doing that. Like, at this point in the season, the personnel is the personnel. You need to make sure these guys are as confident as they can be at this point in the season. And then you need to create good shots, you know, for, for guys that are struggling to make shots. If you're consistently taking tough shots and you're not seeing them go in, that's not a recipe for success either. So I think first it goes confidence, you know, these, the freshmen who have, who have been up and down, you know, still having and seeing success at this level at a high level is going to take time. And until they actually do it on the court, it's tough to have confidence in what they're doing. And then it's creating the right shots and good shots that you can replicate over and over again. And then, the best you can not having a reaction to it and talking about it in the media afterwards or acknowledging that guys aren't shooting, I think only hurts. And as best a coach can, you just continue to kind of shoot the questions and, and trust that it's going to come around. But I think the best you can do at this point is you, you got to find a way to give guys confidence. I think part of it, exactly like Kevin said, it's confidence, it's play calling, it's your role in the team. Uh, you look at Daryl at Maryland um, he got better and better each year, but then he goes to Marquette and shoots it pretty well from three. Uh, if you look at his three point percentages, it was a different system. He had a different confidence level and the coach instilled different confidence into him at Marquette. So I think it's a lot of system like Kevin saying, it's really confidence. So each coach does do it different. And I think for Daryl, it worked out better at Marquette. He was more comfortable there and Shaka gave him more free reign to shoot it. That's why I'm sometimes surprised that a guy like Noah Bachelor doesn't play more because I get it. Reese, we laughed about it. He doesn't grab the basketball when it comes off the rim. He kind of smacks at it. He sometimes doesn't probably play quite as tough as you'd like. But he is a guy that came into college with a reputation as a shooter, from what I hear in practice and workouts, shoots the ball well. So I, I, I'm surprised sometimes that he doesn't get more of a chance to kind of get going in game and just like, look, if you're open, shoot it. And if you miss it, who the hell cares? Next time you're open, shoot it again. Because if you get a guy like that going, and we've talked about him a lot, if you get a guy like Jamie going, and you at least know that if there's two guys on the court that you have to guard, it changes everything. This is also where I think there's the biggest dilemma with coaches at any level. and Because this is where it's different. Talk about confidence from a player's perspective. Say you go into a game and, and Willard plays – Jamie, 20 minutes. Jamie has an off shooting night. It goes one for five. Next night, or you know, a couple games or days later, the, in their next game, all of a sudden he gives those minutes to Noah. Okay, Noah, let's see if let's see if you can knock down some shots. He plays Noah 20 minutes. Noah goes 0 for three. Next game he goes back to Jamie. Like the right. the mind right. games that you're playing at that point with each player, then every shot you're taking has so much pressure behind it. And so in a lot of ways, like you got to find a player that you trust in and you got to stick with him for a period of time to where he feels he can play through a missed shot. He feels like every shot didn't have so much weight on it. He can play through a mistake. But then you go to a coach's side and Willard is trying to win each and every game. And he's like, man, this guy hasn't made one yet. I got I got to find somebody that I can put in and make a shot. Let me try this guy. Well, you know, then you get into a point where you're throwing two or three guys out there trying to find something and none of them get it going because all of them feel like every shot they take is is the biggest shot that they've taken. And so that's where like that happens at every level, but that's kind of the game you play as a coach and, and trying to find somebody to help you out. That leads me to another wonderful question. Cause I think you just answered it. And I think, I, I think that is the answer to this question. This was Evan, Evanston Riker. I don't know what that means. Oh, his name's Riker. Riker. Riker Evanston is his name. Great question. He said, do you still believe in the freshman? What is the difference between DHS Kaiser 
and Jonathan and Cowan Herter Jackson. And I think a big difference, again, I don't, I don't know those guys well enough to understand what's going through their head every, every day, how they are as guys. But I think one thing that made you three very successful my freshman year is that you guys didn't give a fuck. Like, you guys were going to go out there and, and play hard and shoot the ball. You guys had no fear. If you missed five shots in a row, you were shooting a six time. If Ant went out there and he didn't get anything to go, he was still going to affect the game. Justin Jackson was going to affect the game. Like, you guys found ways to affect games and just, you, you guys had like supreme confidence. And again, I don't, I can't speak for our freshmen this year as far as how they're thinking mentally, but I think that is something where like you guys were almost, you guys were not going to be denied as freshmen. Like, you guys are going to play a lot and play well. If that makes sense. I don't know. You could speak more to it because you actually played. But I think it was one of the better recipes in that. And why I'm a little bit – I thought DHS would have a little bit more success this year. I think having Jameer on the team would allow DHS to ease his way into the season and learn from playing with him, not have all the pressure of needing to be the lead guard, the lead scorer on the court. And that's what Anthony walked into when he had Mello. You know, Anthony started, played 30 – two minutes probably game as a freshman, but we had Mello on the court who's it's Mello Trimley. It might be one of the best players in the history of Maryland basketball. But Anthony, right. Anthony wasn't the lead guard, the guy that everyone looked to every single game to make plays. And then both Justin and myself, I think we had early success in that season that kind of allowed us to establish ourselves. You know, Justin, that Georgetown game, I the block at the end of the game kind of, you know, established myself and confidence of playing at that level. And I think Justin scoring wise had a great game in that. And all of a sudden, us three were playing. We knew, like, you know, we were playing 30 minutes a night, and it's a lot easier to find a rhythm. And so early success helps. These freshmen, they didn't get off to a great start. And so I think the pressure from the fans and needing to establish themselves as good recruits, that could be weighing on them a little bit. But even from DHS's point, I thought having Jameer on this team would be great for him. Just being able to play heavy minutes with a guy of Jameer's caliber and learning from him. And then, hey, next year, here's the reins. Take the ball. Like Kevin said, it was. The, I think that mellow point is is a really great point. It was like the perfect like, recipe. Ha- having mellow out there, it's like the perfect recipe in terms of the team started twenty and two. This team starts and loses to Davidson, um, and Kevin, the freshman, really played well. Anthony struggled shooting, but he still affected the game. And Turge basically looked at the guys and said, "You're going to play," so just. Like play with confidence. He trusted it, and he's still that in you all. And again, you start at twenty and two. This team's losing Davidson, and the freshmen aren't playing well. So that just leads to that perfect recipe that Kevin talked about. Reese might have the worst Wi-Fi I think I've ever ever heard in my entire life. I gotta say, <laughs> I mean that's absolutely dog water, dude. You need to get you know whatever. I grew heard. up on a you know, guy grew up on a farm. He's, he's a farm boy at heart. You know what I'm saying? That Wi Fi, you know. Well, those, I, I get think, those mouse running back there, Reese. Yeah, <laughs> I think uh, go milk a cow. I, I think some of the stuff too is the the program that they walked into was much more defined than it is right now. I think we saw that when we went and played against those guys last year. Um, when we went and you know, I think it was Kevin, Jake. Uh, myself, Mello might have been there. Bruno was there. Different vibes, like very different defined roles, different leadership, different, you know, every guy kind of had their own thing going. Transition period. 100%. And I think that's what they're in the middle of. And I think that doesn't just affect coaches into the players. I think that affects atmosphere. It affects comfort how comfortable you are in every single you know aspect of going to the gym no matter where i was or what i was doing i always knew i could go to the gym and i'd be comfortable there but sometimes when you're in this transition period man everybody's walking on eggshells they don't really know where they stand i think the walk-ons are in different spots i think this the starters are in different spots people aren't making shots i think sometimes it creates a vibe that you don't really want I, that's also something that that's a great point that both of you have made that I think gets overlooked is that like it's been a while since I think we've had freshmen come in with the type of expectation that these guys have had like Ant came in and he knew okay Mello's here if he doesn't play well we still have Mello Kev like we still have other wings that are going to play well Justin Jackson we still have LG if you don't play well Sticks came as a freshman and he had Bruno with him 
you know, Aaron Wiggins came in a freshman. He had Daryl with him, right? Like DHS and Jamie this year, they came in and they were like, okay, you guys are starters. And I think a lot of people expected them to play like 30 minutes a game, night in, night out, and play well. And people overlook, like it's hard to be, it is very hard to consistently produce as a freshman in college basketball. Like it is a massive adjustment. It is a difficult game. And it is not abnormal for guys to struggle as freshmen, especially when like these guys are 18, 19 playing against sometimes. How old is Boo Booey, bro? Like Boo Booey might be 25 years old. Like Boo Booey nice though. He's, he's tough. No, he's, yeah. he, he's tough. He's tough. He's tough. I, I've, I've hated on him in the past. He's like that. He's, he's the goods. But like, again, if you're 18 playing against guys who are in their sixth COVID year, like it's not easy. And these guys didn't have the luxury of being able to take a step, a seat, a back seat, and kind of watch guys ahead of them, you know, ease them into the game. So I do think expectations for them were higher than we have seen in quite some time. What do you guys think about past expectation? where last year's success on a team that everybody gave the benefit of the doubt to that they could be bad and then they weren't. And then this year kind of the opposite occurred where, Hey, we have the same core and now we have good freshmen. We have better role players. How much do you think that played factor into, and Kevin, this is very similar to, I mean, you guys are different because you guys are continuing that expectation, but how much easier was it last year when you guys started and everybody thought, oh, it's the Sacramento Kings, we're going to roll them. And then out of nowhere to this year, everybody's like, well, we actually have to play. And when we go to their house, we have to play even better. Yeah, you can't sneak up on teams anymore. Like it it was playing with no pressure is always easy. You play with house money. You know, the expectations are low. And hey, if we we win this, everyone thinks we're great. And if we lose, like, hey, we're expected to lose. It doesn't matter. Uh, The expectations for this team, like what were we, what were we picked you know, preseason Big Ten. Like, I, I don't know how big the, the expectations were coming into this season because of a lot of question marks. And I know we returned, you know, Jameer coming back, Dante coming back, Juju coming back. We're all like, okay, now we got a squat. Now we got some freshmen coming in. That created expectations, I think, within the Maryland fan base because of also we over exceeded expectations last year, even won a tournament game. And, you know, success isn't always linear. We know that. Uh, I think it's more just it's concerning like what, what's next what happens next year you know we're losing our best player we're losing a couple fifth year guys like that for me is the most concerning part bad news on that on that preseason poll we were uh we were third so expectations were high which i think a lot of was like not many teams have two preseason all big 10 players and we had juju and jameer both make the preseason all league team so i think that was very like oh you guys should be sick also we had a better than expected year last year. So I think naturally you're expecting a step forward. So we were third and I, I thought we were going to win a shit, but. Well, the big 10 this year is terrible. So we should be third. Guess who's fourth in the conference right now, or excuse me, fourth or fifth. Minnesota. Oh my God. No way. That's Minnesota. How bad this conference is. Oh my Minnesota. Minnesota. Hey, hey, so we're we're creeping up on March now, which everybody start you know getting a little bit excited. Let's get tight. How many teams? Exactly. That's where these are where you know your balls just shrivel. How many we're teams are going to get in? Three teams should get in. We had ten mm-hmm. last year. Four, 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 four. I lied. I lied. I lied. Northwestern should get in. I think they can get in. Illinois, Wisconsin, Purdue. Yep, that's it. No more should get in. Man, uh, March without is uh, is that it? Cringe. Ne- Nebraska, Nebraska has a chance. Nebraska has a good chance. We beat them by twenty. Man, I don't know if they do. I, I'll be honest. I I don't. Know. They beat they beat Wisconsin. They beat did they? I think they beat Purdue. They beat Purdue. Right? They beat the two best teams of the league. Okay. They've won most of their home games. If they finished strong. They should be good. But even I mean, five is a disappointment. Ohio State has been asked. <laughs> Drew, you you know Indiana is is dog shit. Indiana's dog food. Yeah, they're awful. Um, they're always awful, though. Michigan State has probably been one of the biggest disappointments in college basketball. Yeah, man, that doesn't make any sense. But, fuck, that's the same I thing. Expectations beginning of the season, they bring back a core. That core was not that good. A.J. Hogard is not very good. Tyson Walker is a bucket. He's a hooper. He's great. He's tough. But 
but Malik Hall wildly overrated. You know, it's like little things like that. And I'm hoping people aren't saying that about our team where you go the same three and you look at it and you're like, Dante, pretty overrated. Juju's fine, you know, but he's not, you know, a, a world beater. And then Jameer, he's kind of the goods. They're very similar because Malik Hall and Dante, a lot of people expected them to make leaps this year, but it's also one of those things where those guys have been in college four years. At this point, they kind of are what they are as college basketball players versus some, some people like, you know, again, our freshmen this year, we at least like to think that if they stick around and work in the off season, freshman to sophomore years where you make most people make that biggest jump. But if you're, if you've been in college four years, we kind of know what you are as, as a product. All right. Uh, quick pivot here. We had a uh, first on the panel. Mr. <laughs> Kevin Herter getting a getting absolutely get this guy out of here. Last night I was I was in bed watching them all. I was in bed watching the game and you know they're they're playing really well against the Pistons at home. Uh, I think they're <laughs> without Cade and Boyant, you know, whatever. Who, who's counting? Um but then out of nowhere I kind of rose up from from the sleep a touch because I couldn't believe my eyes Mr. Herter got two quickies. What, explain what happened. Is that a first? That was a first. Just FYI, just by the way, Malik did not get touched or fouled on that, which fouled. stinks because he reacted. But kind of explain it. What what happened there? And how much money did you just get taken out of your pocket? Because we're going to the Dominican Republic and <laughs> kids. We don't want any further fines. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to get one of those. I'm going to peel that and I'm going to get one of them taken off for sure. Cause I did not deserve both of them. I deserved probably one of them. Uh, second of all, he did get fouled. Third of all, obviously a, a frustrating night We're we're playing the Pistons at home with nobody. I think they were, they waved two guys after the game. They had their three best players <laughs> were out. Two guys, got, the G League team. two guys they got didn't traded. Even, they didn't, they didn't take Killian Hayes on the, on the plane. Did you guys hear that? They left him at they the arena and said, hey, gave him a slap on the ass. Have fun tonight. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> purple bottom. They purple bottom. <laughs> uh, big moment of the game, though. Big missed call. We're, we're down eight. A minute 40 left. Malik gets fouled on a three. Right in front of the guy. Uh, a frustrating night. Even I thought the whistle in our favor was not very good all night. And I just let him hear it. Because that was, that was pretty much game. A minute 40 they go back. It's an eight-point game. He misses a call right in front of him. So I had to let him know. I had to let him know. It was a big missed call, and I took my took my two texts and got an early shower. Yeah, so what's what's that look like for you? Uh, two things. My first question. The shower? What is the early <laughs> shower look like? Are you asking the guy, Drew? No, I am asking that, what's actually. Routine? Are you going back to the what's, locker room? What's the routine? Tell me, tell me you guys aren't curious here. You go back to the locker room. It's empty. Do you do you throw a chair first and then you use Dove or Old Spice? No, what do you? What do you do? Writes our, our video room is is on the way back, so we have all our video guys are like in a room cutting film, watching the game. So I just walked right into the video room, sat my butt on a on a recliner, and I just watched the rest of the game and just sat there silent and sulked with everybody, and then went to the locker room and acted really pissed off. Nice. How much? Uh, <laughs> You what? Sorry, that's good. How, how much do you get fined for that? I think it's two a tech. I'm not exactly sure though. It's I'll never see it. It'll just be payroll deducted. You know, it's one of those. It's just, <laughs> not not two hundred people. Just, in case you're curious, not two hundred. It's just it's just it's just out in the atmosphere somewhere, just floating around. It's some cost, man. It's it's, it's going to use it's going to a good cause. Yeah, those are donated back to charity. So, oh, I, I bet I bet Adam that, Silver's. <laughs> Yeah, I, <laughs> I should put that in my taxes for this year. Hey, I donated. There's four grand of charity right there. Thank you, guys. You're welcome. See, it's I guys cussed like out Gucci you, Man man. on national TV. I need that money back. Gucci Man got cussed out. <laughs> it, it's it's guys like Kevin that are finding tax deductions, you know, in everything. Guy gets thrown out of a game, goes to a charity, and he's acting like he's, you know, Barack Obama or something on the side. <laughs> my God, you're not for the people. You are the people. Um, anybody else got anything? Who we got next? Well, what's next on the schedule for us? Hey, and if you guys are still listening, this is a long podcast. I appreciate you. This is long, you know. <laughs> a lot to talk about. Hey, someone's getting a jersey in the next couple of days. At at the Ohio State University on 
Saturday. Saturday. We can win that game. 4 p.m. We got Ohio That's State. Winnable. We got Iowa. We got Illinois. Iowa is very winnable. Ohio State is very winnable. And what was the last one? Illinois? Illinois at the crib. Very Illinois winnable. At the crib. We have a thing for beating Illinois. Don't forget that. Honestly, if you look at the rest of the schedule, this is the last thing I'm going to say. There's a lot of winnable games here. Mm-hmm. The toughest game, obviously, is at Wisconsin. Aside from that, every single game is winnable. What everyone wants to know, what's our, uh, what's our NCAA tournament playoff? What's our, what's our picture here? What, what do we got to do the rest of the season to have a, have a shot? Win the Big Ten tournament. <laughs> <laughs> it's over. What does the NIT look like? Are we, are we in, in good shape in the NIT, folks? No. Who wants, who wants to watch this team in the NIT? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'd rather watch they watch, God, they'd rather watch Minnesota. A guy might drop 30 in. Minnesota. Minnesota. Well, we didn't. We'll be the big NIT. Thing Kevin's sophomore here. <laughs> no, we didn't. <laughs> you remember that day? We were yeah, sitting yeah. in the training room like, oh, we suck. <laughs> oh, our, season, <laughs> yeah. our season's over. Hey. Do you okay, guys think we want to go to Miami tomorrow? <laughs> do you guys think we? Uh, do you think we got invited and and Turgeon said no? No, honestly, no. Because he made us practice. Uh, so I don't think so. We did it. Yeah, nit. No, we did. We did practice for a week. We well, watched the nit it, selection show and didn't get called, bro. But <laughs> my ankles were taped. Hang on. But think about that though. Think about like really think about it. You go to the nit and you don't win it. That looks way worse for a coach than you know what I'm saying? If I'm Turgeon with the group that we had, hell no. Yeah. He knew we didn't want to be there. Just Kevin, the there's a lot of talent on that team. There's a lot of talent on that team. A lot of injuries though. So a lot of injuries. Well. All right. Well, if you didn't hear Drew said it, the fellows are gonna be in Dominican Republic next week. So we're gonna do a group Should pod. pod. Should we pod from out there? We're gonna do a group pod uh, on the uh paper saying I might go. Two things, shirtless, and uh, and I might be drinking a little bit. <laughs> I might be drinking. People forget I was in Chicago with Kevin this past weekend, drinking. Ooh. Ooh. Had a hell of a night. Had a hell, hell of a time. Hell of a hell time. Of- I was jealous. I had FOMO. I had FOMO. Good. Uh, you didn't have <laughs> FOMO over the, the drink bill that I picked up. <laughs> that's not, I that's how much roulette. I did. you play card roulette? That, Is there some card just- roulette involved here? No, that's a that's a regular Saturday. Oh, for this Ke- guy. Kev, just, Kev just said it's you. Oh wow! No, I you picked. The- I was drinking. I drank, and so I was like, "I'll pick up the drinks, whatever." Handed the guy the card, and he started clicking away. Pop, 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 pop. And I'm sitting there like, "Whoa, whoa!" I'm like, "Whoa!" He handed me the bill. It was like eleven hundred dollars. I was like, "Dude, throw it on there. It's a, it's a gold card. It should work." <laughs> it, it hurt. I went back to the seat and I whispered to my buddy that split it with me. I was like, "That was, that was eleven hundred dollars." <laughs> Send the memo now. I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> oh no, that was good shit. Um, but yeah, we'll be in the Dominican Republic. We'll record a podcast. It'll be coming up on March Madness. Uh, yeah. Uh, also, follow the Instagram, uh, Kevin Herders. You know, either game worn jersey or game worn compressions. Both are going to be signed. You you make your decision, and we'll go from there. Uh, We're just saying at, things. At the old Terps, false on Instagram. Be serious. Besides Be that, serious. I think we're good to to cut this thing, and, and we're locked and loaded. Anybody Shout got out us. Shout out us. See you fellas next week. Let's have some fun. Yeah, right. Drinking. <laughs>